Anspruch in front of Finland. Speakers. Uh, basically, uh, I'm Farouk from Monash University, but from Malaysia campus. I teach, uh, used to teach at, uh, at Monash Medical Center uh, and work over there for two years in 2007 and And I went back to Malaysia and work uh, at Monash University over there. I'm basically trained as a cardiac surgeon, so I'm not a professor in some studies like that the families over here. But I basically uh, am a director of an Islamic movement, uh, the Nagas Fund uh, of Malaysia, uh, back home. And uh, this topic actually is uh, something very dear to my heart. And uh, Dr. Sada basically resonates what I have in my mind. You know, like, we have almost a similar wavelength. You know, like, how we think, and how we're presenting is going to be, how I'm presenting is going to be almost similar to what he said just now. I'm trying to basically expand it a little and see what's the concept of this uh, secular democratic state. As compared to, you know, the notion of existential state so. Well, I would say that uh, without doubt that the most important singular event in our century, in the 20th century, would be the Arab Spring. Of course, it was not as phenomenal as the Iranian Revolution in 1979. Yeah, I was young during that time. I was a student. And uh, you know, like, uh, the, uh, how do I say, the spirit from the Iranian Revolution was so much, you know, like, it was so overwhelming. And, uh, you know, it affected most of us. I was far away in Malaysia, you know, before I came to Australia to, to Adelaide, but, but still, you know, like it affected us far away, right? So it was it was very overwhelming, and but there are similarities, I would say, between the Iranian Revolution and the current uh, Arab Spring, right? The most important thing is that it shares the nationwide revolutions from all walks of people, right? Not only from the uh, proletariat, but also even um, from everyone. Right? The academics, the professionals, the businessmen, the students, so every, every one of them. Right? And the aim would be to remove the autocratic regime. The aim of the Iran Revolution at the time was to remove the Shah of Iran. Right? And the aim of the Arab Spring was to remove the dictators during that time. Right? Mubarak <laughs> in Libya, Gaddafi in Libya, and, and a few others. So. All right. And uh, what they wanted, initially, initially, well, it went probably wrong when uh, Professor Kadiva was speaking later on in Iran, for example, initially wanted a democratic country. Right? The spirit was there. The architect of Iranian revolution was uh, Dr. Ali Shariat, and he envisaged a country, a democratic country, right? and a formation of a community, what he called as Russian figure a community of you know, intellect, organic intellectuals who could be the catalyst for movement of, for the country. Right? But of course, you know, something went wrong along the way and, and I leave it to the Iranian experts over here to, to explain about it. But, but the real aim would be similar. Right? The aim of both revolutions, either the Arab Spring or the Iranian Revolution, they would say. Okay, what there are some fundamental differences, I would say. First of all, the revolution is in Iran was led by Ayatollah Khomeini, right? Whereas, whereas the revolution, the Arab Spring, was basically a mass movement of the people. There's no particular leader in that, in that particular movement, right? Even Rashid Kanushi was in exile. He wasn't leader of the movement in Tunisia. He was in, in the UK. Right? He came back after the revolution, so he could not claim. Of course, uh, Khomeini was, was in exile as well. But you know, the people have been spreading his cassettes, his, uh, you know, his talks and everything during before the revolution. And he was somehow the, how do I say, the spiritual leader of the, of the revolution. And um, um, 
the entire concept of this uh, Iranian Revolution, and one thing is that it wanted to establish what we call as Wilayat al Faqih, the jurisprudence or the, the, uh, the, uh, the rule of the jurists, right? So, this is uh, the fundamental difference because this concept of Wilayat al Faqih is so influential that it has effect on many other countries. My country is an example, Malaysia, right? We have an Islamic party over there, we, they call themselves PAS, the Islamic party of Malaysia. And their model of, of, of the system of the organization of the party itself, it actually mimics the uh, Villa al Fakir. Means that they call in, in Malay as Kepipinan Ulama, or what we call basically is Villa al Fakir. It's, uh, guardianship of the jurist, right? So they wanted to model that. It means that the jurist would have the final say about everything, not only on religious aspect, but also on worldly affairs, on politics, economy, and everything. So they dictate the do's and don'ts of our everyday lives, right? Okay, now let's turn into the concept that has been explained uh, very well by uh, about Islamism. Well, sometimes I mentioned about uh, Abu Ahmad al right? And of course, we know that this concept of Islamism, because I was young during this time of Islamism at the time, and you know, like uh, everybody was so much into establishing an Islamic state and working for Islamic government, of course, being influenced by the, the victory of the Iranian revolution. Everybody sees that, you know, there must be a change in society. And women started donning uh, headscarves, for example, in Malaysia. Nowadays, if you go to Malaysia, you, you don't really know that if you, if somebody says that if you are an alien from outer space and suddenly you let, ended up in Kuala Lumpur, you don't know. Are you in, in somewhere in Tehran or are you somewhere in Kuala Lumpur, you know? Like, because almost all the women are covered up, right? So, and you see like, blazing azans from, from the minorites. So, you know, like, it's, it's almost similar. So you can't really differentiate between the two. So this, this concept of Islamism, right? Because it's kind of a movement that starts to establish an Islamic order, and Sharia law, all right? And Muslim moral codes, right? How women should wear, should they go out on their own? Or should they drive cars, for example? And these moral conducts, right? And um, basically, it's all this concept is embedded uh, in one theory being known as Al Amru Bil Ma'ruf Wa Nahi Wa Nanukar. That is uh, loosely translated as commanding good and forbidding evil, right? So, as a consequence, this Islamic normative places more emphasis on people's obligation and then on their rights. It's more concerned on that, right? On their, the people's obligations than talking about their rights as citizens, for example. So, they're not talking, they're not, they're not basically concerned about the rights of people. Okay, and, and this uh, concept, this uh, Islamism makes it very difficult for uh, Islam on one, one hand and democracy to coexist in one single system. Because as uh, Dr. Sabda mentioned correctly, because uh, the concept is that uh, Islamic State or Islam itself is basically something which is you know, derived from God. It's God's sovereignty. And when we talk about democracy, it's people's sovereignty. So what, you know, the tension is that, the thing is that when we talk about democracy, it is somehow or rather we are trying to assert the sovereignty of God. And that is the main tension, right, <coughs> between in, uh, inherent in this concept of Islamism. So if you look at the Arab Spring, for example, now we talk about Arab Spring. And uh, of course, you know, like uh, many um, um, 
Islamic movements across the world, even in the Far East, the Muhammadiyah, the Nantu Ulama, or the Islamic Party in Asia, everyone rejoiced. And everyone thought that you know, it's going to be a re replication of this Islamic project again, right? In, in the 21st century, it failed in the, during the Iranian Revolution. Well, in my perspective, it failed. I don't know how you feel about it. But then, you know, it, people thought that you, know, you might be able to replicate it again. Right, yeah. and um, the the whole idea, cons the cons the mind construct is that of this Islamism project is based on one simple fact. It's the slogan what we call Al Islam Wal Hal. Islam is the solution to everything. So if you want to talk about uh, economic system, the problem of the economic woes, the, the problem of uh, uh, what we're facing nowadays, then let's go back to Islam. Islam, there's a solution there. You know, just find a solution in Islam. How could Islam solve the current economic problem? So when we look at the social problem, for example, then let's go back to Islam and find the, the, prop, the solution to the problem. So it, it solves everything. <coughs> to me, it's merely a slogan. Right? There's no well-defined concept of Islamic economy, even of Islamic economy itself. Not to talk about other things. Even Islamic economic system, economic system. There's no defined concept. People are still arguing, well, what is this an economic, uh, uh, Islamic economy all about? Right? And, you know, by like uh, the current system that we're practicing in our country, in many other countries in the Middle East, for example, where they use uh, Arabic terms, terminologies, to, I would say, is kind of to camouflage the existing uh, capitalist system, right, of of Asia, of Libra, right, of uh, you know borrowing money, but without using the term interest, they use the term. Uh, what do you use the term? Uh, in in Malay, it's pembiayaan. It's like. Um, what is the term? What is the best term to to, to denote it in English? Yeah, probably uh, to say that uh, it's a, a mutual transaction between the two. You know, like you agree to it, and the lender agrees to it, the bank agrees to it. So it's a mutual understanding. So it's all right. It's not interest if it's a mutual understanding. So just the change of one term from loan. To become this, uh, to become to from pinjaman, which is loan, to become pembiayaan, just by change of one term, it becomes legal. Whereas the whole concept is still the same. How could the change in this uh, terminology changes everything when the when the concept is the same, right? If you if you are drinking, uh, for example, um, Carlsberg, for example, then you name it as uh, a cola. Does it change the nature of the existence of uh, a certain percentage of alcohol in Kasmar? That wouldn't be the case, right? So it's, it's an analogy. What I was trying to say was the problem with the, with the, with the Islamic system. So, as I said just now, that they thought that you know, this uh, guardianship of the Jewish would be the solution to the problems that people are facing right now. The, the issue is that personal affairs of the people will come, will turn to become state matters, right? And government has the right to serve as the enforcer of religion. The whole idea of that underlies the concept of Islamic State uh, is uh, uh, of concept of Islamic State that this is the, the main concept is about what we call as Hudud, right, and Sharia laws. So they assume or that if we implement Hudud and Sharia laws, then we have become very Islamic. Right? So if as long as we don't uh, try to as, to enforce Hudud and Sharia laws, then we are we are basically we are not hundred percent Muslims. They're not considered as Muslims, right? Now, uh, Prof. Uh, Sardar just mentioned about a bit about post-Islamism. But I would say that 
the difference. I would concur with what has been mentioned by Asif Bayat, for example. We first a political and social condition in which, after a phase of experimentation, the appeal energy and sources of legitimacy of Islamism get exhausted, even amongst its one ardent supporters. Islamists become aware of the systems anomalies and inadequacies as they attempt to normalize and institutionalize their rule. Right? So as I said, Islam is no longer the solution to all problems. So what, what we're trying to say is that in uh, post-Islamism, the whole concept is not basically to come back to the establishment of Sharia or Islamic State, right? People talk about social justice, about protection of life, of property, about the honor of you know, humanity, about accountability, right? Uh, about distribution of wealth, and most importantly is protection of minorities, right? In our country, we have problems. We have problems with Shiites, for example. Shiites are persecuted in Malaysia, right? They are, they are, many of them are being un, uh, detained under the uh, this, uh, uh, very draconian law called the ISA, Internal Security Act, where you can detain someone without uh, putting him to trial for a minimum of two months. And you can extend that on and on, on and on and on. Uh, two years, yeah, two years, on and on and on. Right? So, so it's, it's um, you know, something inhuman, right? something which is unacceptable. So what we're trying to say is that in this post-Islamism discourse, right? is this, in this post-Islamism discourse, we would say that we will come back to this uh, human nature, right? or the human aspects, the equality, justice, the transparency, the um, rule of law, and things like that. And we're saying that democracy is probably not the best solution, not the best system, but it's the least imperfect of all the imperfect systems in this world. Right? It is the least imperfect. That's, that's the point that I want you to go home and to think about it. Right? It is the least imperfect. I'm not saying that it is the most, the most perfect, but it is the least imperfect. So what we're saying is that because in democracy, we are not assuming the role of God like in, in Islamic State. Like in Islamic State, we're saying every rule and judgment that we make, we're saying that, oh, God says this in the Holy Quran, or the Prophet says this in the, in the, in the Hadith, for example. So you have, so you have to, be, to be true to it. But over here in democracy, we're seeing that it is a human nature, you know, like a human collective effort to try and approximate God's justice. So if we fail in approximating God's justice, it is us, human, who err, right? It is not God. It is different from saying that, no, we are acting on behalf of God. So if we are acting on behalf of God in Islamic State, the problem is what we see in Saudi Arabia, for example, where you know, where um, um, recently a uh, maid <coughs> who basically protected herself from being um, sexually abused by by uh, her employee was beheaded, right? But a cleric who killed, who raped and killed his five-year-old daughter was free. And that's a country that says that it establishes to do and it's up no, and shut me up. So that's a problem that we're having. Okay, because time is is, is very tight. I try I try and, and be um, uh, very brief, right? So okay, I will, I will not talk about this uh, concept of severity because uh, Dr. Sada explained it very well. And uh, I'll just go to what uh, Rashid Khalifi says, which is very important. If democracy is meant, the liberal model of government prevailing in the West, a system under which the people freely choose their representatives and leaders, 
in which there is an alternative, alternation of power as well as all freedoms and human rights for the public, then Muslims will find nothing in the religion to oppose democracy. No reason for us to oppose democracy. And it is not in the interest to do so. Right? Okay. Now, let's crystallize everything. I've said many of the things just now. I'm trying to crystallize again. Trying to say that the problem with religious state is that religion always claimed to be the universal truth. It, it, it has the possession of universal truth, right? Because it speaks on behalf of God. It's basically God's word on, on, this, on this earth, right? Right, okay. This one I've also explained just now that, uh, you know, like, the main intention of an Islamic state is still to impose uh, to Hudud and, um, and uh, Sharia, right? Um, and um, the problem is that as this is the essence of, of an Islamic state, right? The problem is that they're trying to enforce this kind of belief even though they're uh, citizens from other faith, for example, Christians, Buddhists, um, you know, Hebrews, for example. So everyone must accept uh, an Islamic state, so why Islamic state is all wrong. So as I, as, as I would like to mention and I would like to stress again this, this important topic and important point is that, you know, like as I mentioned just now about, about uh, democracy being a, a system where it's between men to men, and whereas uh, a system, an Islamic system is between men to God, there's a sovereignty of God. And if you draw an axis between the two, the vertical and horizontal, and if these two lines meet, there is where the point of friction between the two. And the problem lies when people try to drag God from the high heavens to the earth. And that's the problem that we are facing nowadays. Right? So in every uh, uh, issues relating to governance, for example, then God is dragged to say that God is on our side. That is a situation that we have in many countries and in Malaysia, not, uh, well, we experience the same thing. I've explained about this and I'm going to skip this for the interest of time. And uh, I have to skip this because I don't think I have time to, to stress about it. Right? So what I'm trying to say is that most important thing Okay? Most importantly, we have to understand that the reading of text, right? the reading of the Quran, for example, we as human, we give meaning to reading. How we want to interpret it? Do we want to read it in an authoritarian way and give authoritarian meaning to it? Or do we want it to be humanitarian in nature? Right? A more humanistic approach or reading of the holy text. So the thing, what the main important thing that I want to stress now is that it requires human agency, right? <coughs> In many of my speeches before this, I say that the Quran is not like uh, an ICU manual because I'm a doctor. So in an ICU manual, you have basically uh, details on how to treat, what to do. If you have an arrhythmia, what is the first class drug, what is the second class drug, third class drug, fourth class drug, and how do you want to um, administered drug, IV bolus, or you want to do a, a slow infusion, or whatever. So everything is in there. Whereas the Quran is not like that. It's not like ICU book, right? It is not like an ICU manual where you can you can basically you know you have a problem, you have to look at it. It's not like that. It has okay. It has a general principle, right? It has only general principle. And based on these general principles, you have to use your human reasoning and human agency to try and derive what is the best aim. Because the ultimate, the maqasid, the higher intention of the Quran itself is justice. Right? So whatever we do to try to understand the, the text of the Quran, 
is to approximate God's justice. And that requires us, us our human agency. Right? So as I said, as a conclusion, because time is up, the solution to me and to the Sasabda as well is that we have to go back to a secular state. Right? A secular state, like Dr. Sasabda said, is, uh, Sabda said just now, is not laicity. It's not trying to say that, you know, there's no place for religion in life. Right? It's not that. It's not that. Right? The, the main problem is because of our uh, experience with uh, communism a long time ago that it made us very resistant towards this idea. And as uh, Dr. Sabda mentioned correctly, the most important thing is the state neutrality. Okay. Right? What we call as secularism. We are, we are saying that the state must be neutral. That is the most important thing. Right? So, only a secular state could give a true meaning to a phrase of as I mentioned just now earlier on, al amru bil ma'ruf wa nahi wa nunkar. Right? Unless, meaning to say that whatever we do is because of our personal conviction, not because we're scared of the state legislative laws. <coughs> because the state is trying to enforce that we have to wear hijab, for example. Women have to wear hijab, they will wear hijab because of that. No, it must come from our own personal conviction. And living in a secular state will allow us to live in that personal conviction. So genuine piety, as I said, only arises through personal choice. All right? And that choice only becomes possible when there is freedom. In, art, in other words, freedom to sing is a necessary medium to be sincerely pious. So it is our choice. Thank you very much.